So I don't see Jamie. I'm going to brief send that message to her. Okay. What do we think? Good? I think we're good. Yep. Stand and yeah, we'll do the lunch. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's weird to be doing. It's a public input statement. Yep. Uh, the first public input session is a 15 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. But a second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give his or her name, address, and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that fall under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input. And there is a live stream link that you can click on to make your comment. Okay. We do have some public input tonight. This is from Mr. Hutchinson from North Berwick. And um, he just states and is asking a little bit, haven't gotten a clear answer on power outages versus snow days. If a section of one town is without power for more than a day, how is it fair for those kids to be accounted for the same work as the others? It is the absence of the school, not the child. Do you want to respond to that? Sure. So I think what I would say is we've been lucky, knock on wood, that that hasn't happened in a while, but we, we wouldn't hold a student um, accountable because school is out or they're without power, we would certainly handle it that they could be doing some makeup work or touching base with the teachers and rearranging so that they can get some of that instruction that they missed. Okay. That's it for our public input. All right. We have a student report. Yes. So Aaron Kinsey is with us. Hi, Aaron. Aaron is a, I'll, I'll introduce you a little bit and then you can go right ahead. But Aaron is a junior this year and she is um, a former Hussey School student and um, family um, has gone through the school system and is going through the school system. And we're really happy to have you with us, Aaron. Happy to be here. Uh, like she said, I'm Erin, uh, and I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak. Um, points I had thought about discussing are, of course, activities going on. There's lots of different things on what is and isn't happening, especially with COVID restrictions. Uh, there's some sports going on. Uh, wrestling, I believe, is trying to start up. Um, uh, in person, uh, there's an online video game club going on. Um, and then also uh, Theater XL and like stuff like Theater XL and the cooking clubs have, they started last year transitioning to online and are continuing to do so this year. That being said, while a lot of things can be done online and with restrictions, I know that there are still some students who uh, are bummed with some of the things that they're missing, homecoming, prom being two of the major ones, stuff like that. That's what I essentially have. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Do you want to just go around and introduce yourselves to Erin just so she knows um, where everybody's from? Sure. Um, Denise Mallet and I am a Berwick resident. And the board chair. And the board chair. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie Hagenbu from Lebanon. Nancy Newbert from Lebanon. And the assistant board chair. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Joanne Potter and I'm from Lebanon. Amy Creighton, director of nursing. Sue Austin, assistant superintendent. Audubon Bay, superintendent. 
I'm Denise Van Camp and I'm the business manager. Hitting in the background. Well, I got my own window. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then we have board members remotely. Estrita, you want to go? Hi, um, I'm Estrita Schaefer, North Berwick. Welcome. Okay. Go I'm ahead, Emily from North Berwick. Rebecca Hopper, North Berwick. Hi. Can you get a little short? Yeah. Go ahead, Linda. You're muted. Hi, Hi I'm Linda Gullis, I'm representing Berwick. Nice to meet you all, and I look forward to this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. So you're only missing Mr. Dwyeran, who is also from Berwick. Never to be um, forgotten. Never to be forgotten. That's right. <laughs> He'll appreciate that. Um, okay, minutes of the January 21st meeting. I had one um, correction okay, in, no. in, under other. They just need an extra E for meeting. It's the uh, second sentence in the first paragraph. Thank you. Yep. All right. Under. Oh, gotcha. Fixed. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments, corrections? You get a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as amended. I'll second it. All in favor? And if you guys on remote can actually just say yeah. aye. They all have their hands. Aye. 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 Um, okay, financial update. Oh boy, are you guys ready? We're ready. We're get into some numbers. Okay, so I am gonna try to share my um, document so that I can. Is it the same as the one that? Yep, it's the same as the one I emailed. I figured it might be easy to see it just up on the screen. Let me find it. I have a lot of tabs open. <clears throat> Hmm. Try that one. There we go. Everybody can see that. There it is. Woo! Fancy. Mm -hmm. oh, it's not the same. Is that not what you have? I have the financial summary. Oh, this is yeah. This, this is the updates for. This is the kind of the link. Oh, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So that's not the first thing I'm going to discuss. So the what I'm going to do is I have a bunch of things I want to discuss. The summary is one part of it. But there's a there's a more scope to it this evening than just that summary. And it was in an email that Denise sent a half hour oh, ago. Oh, the oh, update, oh. yeah. So I shared it, the document with you. In addition, I emailed it in case one is easier for you than another. Okay. Um, and the financial summary was attached to the agenda. This is a document that we that I just shared and created. Um, so there are, there are a couple of things going on that we just wanted to kind of keep everybody in the loop on where we stand with different things. I'm going to start with COVID grant funding. So you're all aware um, that we received uh, many different grants over the last year or so. Um, one, of, one of the first, well, this wasn't the first we received. We received a coronavirus relief fund grant, it's called a CRF. Um, that award was 2.3 million, as you can see here, and all of the money had to be spent by December 30th. Once we spent it, they have just extended that to June, but well, we spent it already, so it's all good. Um, that was the first one we received. We then received a second coronavirus relief fund. Um, I believe that was in October that they notified us of that, and again, it had a December 30 end date and we were a little worried if we could spend it. We spent every penny of both of them. They're, they're spent, they're documented, um, and they really helped us out. 
The uh, first one, as you can see, we spent on things like buses, vans, storage, hotspots, um, subscriptions, supplies, PPE. It, it was pretty much everything, and it kind of kept us going through the summer into the fall. The second coronavirus relief fund also uh, helped us, but had more a little more focus on technology, that uh, wonderful audio library um, that they were able to purchase, um, some literacy support, some more PPE, touchless fixtures in the bathrooms, things like that. So there's a whole list here of things. Um, and again, we were concerned given the short time frame that we were gonna be able to spend it giving procurement rules and how many bids you have to get and things like that. But we were able to, because of the staff and the cost center directors and administrators, we did great. Um, the adult education program also was awarded some funding. They were awarded $3,719 and change. Um, and they spent it on the kindergarten book bags that they normally do because they didn't want to go out and solicit businesses at this time. Um, some online high set tests and some document cameras for their department. We then come into um, two grants. Um, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief number one, which is called ESER. Um, that was the original money we were notified of last, I think it was March or April, 439,855.90. Um, we are still in the process of spending that money. It's able to be spent through September of 22, um, but I feel like we will be able to spend it by the end of June um, maybe the end of August, because we're paying for some of our remote staff that we had to hire during the pandemic and some of the extra staff. Um, we'll need to spend it on some school nutrition staffing and potentially PPE and some other COVID related things. These are all have to be COVID related expenses. So we're keeping an eye to that. And then we are our most recent award was the ESER II grant, which is approximately 1.8 million. It is more flexible. The ESER grants are more flexible than the CRF. Not only are they a longer period of time, but their requirements on what you have to spend it on are a little less rigid. Um, and that has an end date of September 30th of 23. So we have time to think about how that's going to help us and, and get us through the next couple of years. Um, I will tell you, I do want to thank um, my office staff, yeah. particularly Mary Ellen Bourbon and Kathy Vancour. Mm -hmm. I will tell you they've worked every day, including weekends for months at the end of last year so that we could get this done. And without them, it would have been impossible. So I just want to throw a shout out to them because what they did was so valuable. Does anybody have any questions on the grants or? Um, I don't know if this will be covered later in the yep. financial update, but I'm curious to know, I guess, what impact this has on our, on the general budget from this year. So if that's stuff you're going to cover later, that's fine. Well, it's a good question. Um, the Sierra funds, so those two at the top that are 2.3 and 2.4 million dollars, they had to be spent on things that were not previously budgeted. So those had they had no impact on the things that were already budgeted. However, they were able to pay for items that were made it made us able to carry out the year. Really, they provided extra buses. They provided food delivery vans. Um, it covered wages for all of these new teachers that we had to hire. Um, all the technology, all the hotspots, all of those things were covered here because they were not in our original 21 budget. The ESER funds don't have that restriction. So if we decide that we wanted to move something there after the fact, it, again, it gives us a little more flexibility, but um, that's the biggest impact. So those saved us. We spent, again, um, what is it, $5.8 million on things that we didn't have to use local money for. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, minor question, because I didn't know this was in here before, but like, do we have touchless bathroom fixtures in yep. all the bathrooms now? That's cool. Yep. In the that high is, school, definitely. In the, in the middle definitely. school. Yep. Yep. Might be the high school and the middle school. That's great. But yep. we're working through But it. we're working, yeah. right. That's one of those that things we're those. trying to pull right. through. Because it's good hygiene anyway, right? Yeah. It's, it's a good thing anyway, so. Yep. Huh. Yeah, there was a lot of work to just, in terms of um, those safety measures, to decrease the amount of hands-on, you know. And were we able to get enough of a surplus of PPE that it's still going to kind of carry us forward? So that is our next endeavor. We, um, because we have to budget for next year and we have to analyze where we currently stand. Um, after the grant, and I've spent the last few weeks budgeting, that's really part of my last budget effort is to figure out where we stand with PPE. But I would anticipate if we needed any, that it would be covered by one of these ESER grants, that we that we would put that money there. Um, I think we did a good job on stocking up. I think we have plenty of some things, and I think other things have been used more. Um, but I, I can bring that back to you as as solid numbers um, at a you know at a future meeting. Yeah. That's yeah, when, when, when we do talk about it later, I would just be interested to know, you know, last summer we had no idea like how this was going to go down. Right. So I would be interested to know like what were the winners and what were the ones that we didn't end up needing as much of. Yep, we have um, lessons learned. I guess would be yep. interesting. Okay, I, because we have all of that. It's actually sitting on my desk right now. Um, we have a an inventory that puts in all of the purchased items. So how many of small, large, medium gloves? Like it's by item. How many people have used and requested and what the current balance is? And then Kevin goes through on a monthly basis and reconciles the actual inventory to the list. So we're, we're sure that it's all kind of there. So I can definitely bring that back next time. Is all this money forgiven? We don't have to pay any of it back? No, we don't pay any back. It's just a grant. That's great. Yep. Thank you. It's helped us survive for sure. Mm -hmm. And some was convenient, right? Some we needed PPE, buses, things like that. The, uh, the audio library, what a great you know, improvement. We tried to get a little bit like, you know, what, what will be a benefit us long term versus just this, you know, the mass. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Any others? Okay. So on your agenda, I can't show both, but on your agenda was attached the December um, financial summary, which is the monthly report that you get. Just take one second here. Maybe I can stop showing that. bring that up. I'm going to stop presenting for a second. I'm going to present another the tab which shows it. So um, the revenue side here shows that, again, our state subsidy and our local tax revenue are on par with where we are in the year. The way I look at this is if I look down below the grid in the fiscal year and the school year, um, the fiscal year shows me that as of December, 50% of the, of the fiscal year is completed. And when I look up at revenue, I see that 50% of state subsidy is remaining. Similarly, local tax revenue. That kind of tells me we're on track to make those um, 
those targets. And those really are, unless the town is having particular trouble or something odd is going on, those should really be kind of be in line. The uh, fund balance to be used, it is available to us. We don't yet need it. And so there it is available to us. It's not something that comes in the door. It's already here. So that's, uh, that's why that looks like that. And then the other is all of the other miscellaneous revenues that we receive, bank interest, um, when we share positions with other districts, reimbursements, um, miscellaneous revenues, if we sell a bus and we get some proceeds, things like that. Um, they're generally smaller amounts with the exception of shared positions with other districts. Um, and some of those come in periodically. Um, most of the most of what we receive so far, I believe, are, are positions. Um, and then as we go through the year, it kind of picks up a little bit. Um, down in the expense categories, we can see the appropriated amounts, amounts expended, which means the money has literally been paid either with a check or a direct deposit, encumbered amounts, which are salaries, generally salaries and benefits that have not yet been paid, but we anticipate paying them this fiscal year, a total of the, of the amounts encumbered and expended, and what we have left as a balance. And again, some of these have, um, you'll see, for example, regular instruction has 7% remaining. That's because regular instruction largely are teaching and ed tech salaries and benefits. That's the majority of it. There are instructional supplies and other things, but based on the size of the category, there's most of it goes to salary and benefits. So it's gonna be either expended or encumbered. Special education is similar. Most of those things are salaries and benefits as opposed to other, other things. Um, other instruction you'll see is 57% remaining. Again, based on the extracurricular, co-curricular, summer school, based on those things, they tend to incur a little bit in like November, December, and then again, May, June. So you're gonna see a split there and more will be remaining at this point in the year. And again, I kind of go down through the different categories like that, just trying to make sure that I think it's an appropriate balance given the time of year. Does anybody have any questions on this? If not, I'm going to, you can, I'm sure you have it. I'm gonna go back to my, um, to share my document. <clears throat> okay. So if you, um, the updates we have. So overall, it looks like we're good. Um, there are some variances to the budget that I just wanted to remind you or bring to your attention. Um, revenue shortfall, we have a, we're going to have about an $85,000 shortfall in other revenue. That was that 400 and plus amount out there. The reason for that is um, we have decided not to collect sports activity fees this year and there was a $50,000 budget for that. So we will not be receiving that $50,000. Um, similarly, given um, interest rates and, and such, our budgeted bank interest, which was budgeted at 50, is going to come in closer to 15, which will give us a, about a $35,000 uh, loss in that line. Is that just because we're different balance than expected or what's it has little less to do with the balance and more to do with the interest rates that are super low right now um we we are still at fifteen thousand dollars a year i think four years ago we changed the bank worked with us to change how we're earning interest and changed it to be tied to the T bill. We had a little windfall then right we uh, had a w huge windfall we used to collect somewhere around three hundred dollars a month and now, even with this, we're somewhere in the twelve dollars or $1,300 range. Um, so it's still much more than it was before, but it has backed off where we were $40,000, $50,000 uh, to the good. 
I anticipate that that will be that that will rebound at some point, but um, we'll take this into account for our fiscal 22 budgeting. Um, we also, though, have some expense savings. Um, technology um, saw about $105,000 savings on their devices for staff and students. This was helped out by some of that um, grant money and different things that happened, but um, they were able to move things around to, to give us the savings um, for the year. In addition, we had some routine maintenance and CIP projects that were in the budget that we decided last July based on COVID and buildings and things that we were going to postpone just um, for, for different reasons in all of them. But the four pods to be painted at Noble High School, uh, there just wasn't time over the summer based on all the cleaning and planning that needed to happen. So that was postponed. Um, the garage at MHA was postponed. We, it was originally a $60,000 project and we put 30 in to um, get it started kind of with students building it and everything, but given COVID, that wasn't going to be something we were going to be able to accomplish. Um, we also did not resurface the gym at the Knowlton School and the Beach Ridge field repairs are gonna be put on hold for this year. All of these things are in, or will be in the fiscal 22 budget to be done, um, but these were just not ones that were able to be done for, for a variety of reasons. The savings for all of these projects um, are amount to 197,000. And we still have potential areas of savings as well. Um, I anticipate I, they're hard to estimate right now because we haven't gone through enough of the year, but I anticipate some transportation savings, you know, fewer field trips, um, no field trips, right? No, no. Um, fewer, fewer meaning zero, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, athletics, both stipends and transportation to games. Heating oil, we've had a mild winter, but we still have so much of the winter left. I don't feel comfortable kind of calling that one yet. Um, medical premiums, we're seeing some savings there. Um, but again, I prefer to get a little bit through the year before I count on them. So we do have pockets of other savings, but um, the ones I presented are the ones I'm, I'm confident on right now. So if we have these savings, I know we can't take that money and apply it to next year, but how do we, benefit from that savings without then basically asking for just as much next year. Does that, do we put it into the fund balance and then use it from that? Yeah, so what really happens is um, at the end of the fiscal year, we take our revenues that we collected and our expenses and whatever we have uh, as, a, as a positive bottom line goes into the fund balance at that audit. And so the following fiscal year. So any savings we see this year won't be in the 22 budget. They would be in the 23 budget under fund balance. The other thing it does is these savings too. You know, um, as hard as we budget and as tightly as we budget, every year brings unexpected occurrences. And for example, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, we had boilers at Hanson, I think, went. And there's $80,000 a piece that's not in the budget. So some of this is done sometimes to say, okay, well, we're not gonna resurface the floor because we need to do the boiler. It's kind of like you would do at home, but um, so, the, so the savings in some areas is usually taken up by something somewhere else. It's, it's, really, um, it's, it's really kind of like your, again, like your home budget where you know, you plan a certain way and something comes up and you have money to cover it. Um, so we try to, as we try to keep track of where the big variances are. Um, I'll talk, I'll speak to this more later, but in our audit, during the audit process, one of the things they asked me to do is they run a report of all the budget line items and all the actual expenses. And I have to explain to the auditors when there's a big variance. So if we had a $200,000 budget and we spent 10, they want me to explain why and vice versa. 
Um, what it really, what I think for fiscal 20, fiscal 20, I think I had to answer five questions out of all of those lines because everything was so little. It was a little bits here and there. Um, so again, these, uh, these are the bigger ticket items that I can identify at this point. And they will ultimately come back to us in a fund balance. Okay. Any other questions on the, on the summary? Okay, we're moving on. We're moving on to school nutrition, fiscal 21. Um, so school nutrition has been, as Abby will, will attest, has been a particular challenge. Um, they have, there are basically two types of reimbursement. We have the school nutrition program, which is the one where people fill out free and reduced applications. They're either qualified to receive a free or reduced meal or not. The students pay money who are, who are not eligible um, and kids come in and pay. When COVID hit, they switched it to the other type of reimbursement, which is through their summer program. And what they did was they said, we're gonna pay you for every, Abby, correct me if I'm wrong, we're gonna pay you for every meal you serve, um, yeah. but uh, the reimbursement is different. Um, so Abby, why don't, you, why don't you give them kind of maybe a brief overview of, of the school nutrition and how it stands now and what all the, iterations maybe we've been through? Yeah. So in April, the um, USDA switched over to the summer feed, it's an emergency summer feeding program. And as Denise mentioned that you get reimbursed for every meal you serve to any child under, under the age of 18. Um, that's very different from the National School Lunch Program, but we were op you know, operating in a very different manner. We were providing at that point remote meals for pickup. We were trying to provide seven days a week, which we were allowed to under that program. And over the summer, it actually was pretty beneficial for, for our program. Um, and then the school year began and we were under the hybrid model. And as a result of, you know, the safety measures, about half the kids were in the schools, you know, in the schools on a daily basis. Um, at the elementary, we have, we don't have Wednesdays for students in the buildings. Um, so we are still operating under the summer feeding program, which we're going to operate under for the whole school year. Uh, but, but, you know, there's a significant loss because we're just not capturing the kids that we used to capture. Um, and it's pretty significant. You know, we can't have our catering events anymore. You know, all the cart and our feeding model is completely different. Um, just as measures to help keep the kids safe. And, you know, our staff is needed to spread out amongst, you know, at the high school we're used to feeding in one location, now we're feeding out of three locations um, just to keep everyone separated. So it's pretty significant. Um, this was the best that the USDA could do, which is, you know, beneficial certainly to the families. It's free meals for all children. Uh, but I know pretty much every school nutrition program is suffering at this point, so pretty significant. So what happened over the summer is the summer we were able to um, make more money than we spent because we had certain number of staff feeding and having pickup by families, you know, the different locations um, and the reimbursement was favorable. Once we get to school here, um, the, that ratio was it's off. We have more expenses to run these kitchens than we have meals being served and reimbursements being received. So the, they're asking us now, there are two different reporting requirements. School nutrition program it has different reporting requirements for the state than the summer program or this emergency summer program. Um, the first, they're asking us to report by quarter. So the first quarter had all of those summer gains and then the September where we weren't making much money, but the program was still in an okay spot. When we looked at second quarter, again, keeping our eye on it and knowing that it was a concern, but not able to yet quantify things, 
when we when we looked through December, Abby and I looked at each other and said, okay, we have we're we're definitely going to see a loss this year. Let's try to cal calculate what that looks like. So we worked together to come up with this estimated loss for 21, fiscal 21 of 400,000. Um, Abby, do you remember how much a day that is? Was it 2,000? It's about $2,000 a day. That's what our deficit is. So we calculated how many school days are left and where, what does that look like? And none of the CARES money or the ESSER money can cover that? So yeah, yes and no. So the um, it, what I what I did was the first thing I did is said, well, we budgeted twenty five thousand for contingency for food service in the DIP twenty one budget. So that's going to go to cover some of that loss. The um, school nutrition program at the end of fiscal twenty has a seventy five thousand dollar fund balance that can be used to offset that. We're going to use ESA funding from ESA one funding for the 75,000 that we had not yet budgeted for anything else. Um, we have still have 20,000 in technology savings from up above and all of those things. We still have that. So that's there. Abby has been fabulous about applying for every grant she can find. So we have recently received another $5,000 full plates, full potential grant, which will cover some costs. Um, we have about 112,000 savings from postponed <coughs> CIP projects. And um, 88,000, I'm confident enough in 88,000 for medical premium savings. I think there's more out there, but I think this will cover it. So. We're looking at the ESER one grant covering about 75,000 of this shortfall. So it's safe to say that the estimated $400,000 loss is due to, is due to COVID. Straight up. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we operate just like many restaurants, as you can imagine. Um, it's it's a pretty similar system, so it, it's pretty significant, you know, with all the modifications that we have to make. And it's really like Abby, and maybe Abby can speak to this a little bit. This is the wor almost the worst case scenario is the hybrid model, right? Because if everybody was back in school and we had regular reimbursements. We would be in the break, at least breaking even like we had been prior to COVID. We were a little bit better than that, but we would be in that area. Um, if everybody was remote, like last spring, that was still a good situation for us, Abby, right? Because we could determine yes. staff and, um, yeah. and that sort of thing. But in order to run the kitchens in the buildings, we need more staff than that. And um, you have fewer meals served and more staff. Yeah. And everybody's struggling with this, yep. those schools that are hybrid and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yep. it's, it's I don't think there's a food no. a nutrition program in, at least not in New York County, that isn't sort of in the same boat that we're in right now. So we, the, the good news though, is that we have the savings and the, and the balances in some places to cover this loss for fiscal 21. And that's really the takeaway. Right, we do have things that will be will make this so um, we can cover whatever loss that is. By state law, school nutrition programs are not allowed to have a negative balance at the end of the year. The school district has to cover whatever that loss is. So this will be how we how we go about it this year. Are you ready for twenty? Two on a similar topic. So uh, as we again are are looking at our fiscal 22 budgeting, if operations continue as is in this summer mode, if next September we're still in a hybrid mode, and we do that for the whole year, um, we estimate that $500,000 will be the shortfall, and we'll have to figure out how to cover those cover that expense. 
If we go back to normal again, we would anticipate a break even situation. So we really, until we get into the year, won't know, um, but we'll need to budget as if the worst case, probably the worst case scenario is coming. We have some ideas on how to do that, um, that won't be fully on the on the bottom line of the of the district budget. So we will um, will increase the the, the amount. Um, the taxpayers currently pay one hundred twenty six thousand. That's what the towns contribute toward the school nutrition program. We anticipate a, a big percentage increase, but I'm thinking um, maybe to like one hundred forty somewhere in there. It's a um, it's bigger than we usually do, but it will help our bottom line. And then um, using some fund balance and some ESER two grant funding, I think we can cover those those extras should they occur. Again, in an ideal world, I, I assume we're vaccinated and we're back at school and we're not we're not having to distance. But um, I don't know. Again, it's right. it's too early to know. Way too early down. to tell. So we're going to um, be cautious in our budgeting. Prepare for the worst. Yeah. If we, like, okay, let's just say we can go back, but we still have a, a, like a remote component, a remote academy, call it whatever we want. Mm -hmm. Does that, what kind of impact does that have where there's still some kids that are remote? But I think it- Kids that are in are in. How, does that have any impact? I think it depends on what model the school nutrition program is going to be run with. If it's the school nutrition program, it's going to look, and the numbers will be very different than if it's a summer feeding program where you can feed everyone under the age of 18. Um, I don't know if you have something you wanna to say to that, Abby, or? Um, just the, we will still have to offer meals to those children that are enrolled in our district, whether they're receiving learning remotely or in person. Um, the, I think the biggest impact to our program is if children are gonna be in five days a week. Um, I think that's the most significant impact. If children are only in a couple of days a week, then we see the, you know, the negative downfalls of that. But we would still offer meals to those families, whether or not they take them, that's, you know, that's up to that family, but it, they would still be available and we'd be able to claim them. And again, to what Denise is saying, um, the National School Lunch Program, which we usually operate under, it, it's a lower reimbursement rate. So if we, if the federal government chooses, that's how our program is going to be reimbursed, that could have a you know, an impact on us as well, or if they will continue to offer the summer feeding at the higher reimbursement rate and free for all children under 18, um, that could have, that changes things too. And there's really not any indication, any way as to what's going to actually happen um, at this point. So it's hard to anticipate that. Abby, are they, they're talking about potentially um, free for all kids, right? Right. Um, they are certainly highly encouraging meals to be free for all children. It just, I don't know under which program they're going to claim the meals under. Again, they're different reimbursement rates. So there's a huge push to make meals free for all children, in which case we would receive um, reimbursement for every children at, a, you know, dependent on which program we're under. Yeah. Stay tuned for adventure, I think is really what we yeah. need. Yeah. Oh, will probably change September 30th. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't know if that answers your question, Denise, or helps kind of give some insight. Yeah. Okay. So again, noting that part of that um, fiscal 22 amount I'm anticipating using some fund balance. Let's go into the status of the audit, um, the fiscal 20 audit. So our audit is usually complete by December 30 each year. Um, this year we applied for an extension to March 31st. The federal government didn't come out with guidance on how to audit all of these federal COVID grants until November, December. And that's when the auditors had to go back to all of the schools they had audited and kind of redo all of those parts. 
So the audit firms throughout the state were backed up because they got such late guidance. So I think most districts applied for this extension. Um, I am currently working with Amy, our auditor from Runyon, Kirstein, and Ouellette. Um, we're reviewing final drafts of financial statements. We're making sure wording and numbers and all of those things are right. So I anticipate that finalized audit documents will be ready sometime this month. Um, and that the presentation, the following presentation to the board in March. Um, from the draft financials, again, these are not final, but we haven't yet come up with any numbers to, to dispute them. <laughs> um, our fund balance at June 30 will be $3.48 million, 3,480,000. Um, when you take away prepaid expenses, and funds that we're using in fiscal 21, and you take away the 750,000 reserve that we usually maintain, that means we'll have approximately 1.6 million available to offset our fiscal 22 and or future budgets. So that's really good news. Yeah. We didn't squeak by, we didn't, we have money to choose how we how we apply it. Do we apply it to school nutrition? Do we apply it to um, other yeah. other big ticket items yeah. through the budget cycle? So um, I just wanted to let you know that that is there. That's good news. And um, we can have conversations about how, how that's gonna go. And then um, also related to fiscal 22, we received on January 25th, our subsidy numbers. And if you remember, they told us to expect about a 10% reduction, which was about $2 million. And the preliminary subsidy was a reduction of only 367. Only I say, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> total? Total. Or oh, I thought that was just for one month. But yeah, no, no, for the whole thing. For the whole thing. I know. Um, Doesn't it feel good to be, yeah. uh, be happy about it? Happy about it. <laughs> yeah. I think the state does it on purpose. We're just going to prep you for the worst, <laughs> right? But that is, yeah, that was a, a, a benefit. Crazy. So again, we're seeing, we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing some things that are challenges, but we're also seeing some good things that are helping us kind of get through, get through these financial times. You know, the grants have been instrumental. A decent fund balance can be used as we see fit. That the subsidy was not as big as expected is a very good thing. Um, so I'm feeling pretty positive about, as positive as I can about where we are and where we're gonna be as we go through the next year. Now that said, we do have lots of unknowns, right? We don't know. Um, how things are gonna go and we're gonna to have to budget for things like PPE and those sorts of things. So um, it, it's it's a good place, but there are big, big ticket items. The other thing to remember, if, um, we also spoke recently about going out um, in November. Yes. yes. We spoke about going out in November for um, a, the, the building additions. Um, and we also, with the SRRF, know that we have an overage that we'll need to cover, a significant overage in the price of those of those projects, which was about five hundred thousand. So there, we have big things coming. So, but I think the ebbs and flows will will get us through. So I know that this is a lot to digest and you should probably, um, you know, go home, review it again. And if you have other questions, I will certainly come back next time, uh, Denise, with some inventory information. And then um, if you have time to review this and have any questions, if you wanna send them to me or to Audra, and we can work on those to bring answers back when we come next time as well. Does anyone? on the screen have any questions? There's no, they're shaking no. Okay, okay. 
Any other questions? This is good to have it all in one place. It's yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is great. I'm glad it's, it's helpful. Concise and yeah. all together. So right. I'm glad it's helpful. Um, yeah. And again, any questions? Happy to answer. And I just want to thank you, Denise, because okay. it's it's a massive, massive yeah. job here. It's been busy. It's, it's, been, been, it's been busy nonstop. Just yeah. like you said, with Kathy and Mary Ellen, right. you're right there with it. So Thanks. thank you. Yeah. And I would yeah. think other than the PPE, I mean, we pretty much got whatever we would need for as technology and all that oh, stuff for yeah. next year. We're in good. So, I mean, the overages would just probably be PPE stuff. So. We are technology-wise in very good shape. Yes. Yeah, we, we were able to really take advantage of the opportunities that were given to us. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of ground that has been kind of covered this year that's that's gonna prep us well for next year and be able to look at our look at our budget pieces and, and be very strategic, I think. Which is good. Um, yeah. But again the hardest part is that we we just don't know. Like we're planning for three different versions of the world, right? Because we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The good news is at least we know that we have to plan for three versions. Right. Last right. year we just were like, oh my gosh, here we go. You, know? you have to start somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly. We did. It's really very impressive. I think you guys are doing a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. Denise is uh, Denise and her crew. Yeah. Yeah, they're, well, been they're unbelievable. Good. And not nearly as cranky as she could be. <laughs> <laughs> we just send her home. We're just like, go home, go work from home. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, policy readings. Sure. Who so, thought those would be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it's really not a first reading. It's just giving you. Um, say it. We just Anything wanted to share our. I don't know. We decided to talk about policy. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to share our current policies for anything that hit Title IX. Oh. Um, this um, summer, the Title IX guidelines and regulations have changed significantly. Uh, most of that has to do with how we, as a district, look at um, how we investigate any kind of um, allegations of any kind of sexual harassment um, or anything that falls under Title IX. So we... Um, provided those for you to look at, but our policy committee will look at the three, the new policies, um, and then we'll come back for a first reading. But just this was just to give you kind of an update on where we are with our current policy with that. Um, the document of changes is about over a thousand pages. So there's just a lot of information. Um, they've really um, honed in on the definition of what sexual harassment is and um, as well as the procedures that the schools need to follow to investigate properly. Um, I think there's a real tight um, investigation process that hadn't been present before. We've always done investigations, schools have done investigations, but this is gonna be pretty prescriptive and subject to change with new administration as well, which is what we've been told. Yeah. Um, so our policy committee will move ahead with the first readings of those policies and we'll bring it back. Yep. Um, just so you are aware that those are the ones, our non-discrimination, harassment of staff, harassment of students, um, and then those pieces that go under it, um, the complaint procedures. So that's upcoming. Yep. Can, can you just remind me, who's on the policy committee again? Estrita. And Joanne, I think, right? Oh, no, Joanne stepped on. Stephanie. Oh, it's Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah. Do we have any, uh, any, um, as far as I know, we don't have a meeting scheduled. Can we do that real quick? Yeah, we can. So is it just the two of you guys? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. All are welcome, Denise, if you'd like to join. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, if I, I would love to be on the emails, and if it's something I could Dial okay. during the day. If it's something I could dial into just to hear it, I would love to. Um, but I, it's probably not something I can attend in person, just time wise. Yeah, well, I would be doing everything remote myself anyway, so. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Keep me on the keep me on the emails. Okay. Um, I think Estrella was looking for a time right, right. now. Do you want to right. want to grab yeah. that? All right. Do you want to look at next week or sure. the week after? 
Okay, Stephanie, do you have a calendar handy or do you want to do this after? We can do it now. Okay. Mine as well, no template for present. Okay. I'm pretty much wide open except for Thursday. Thursday is getting all four cats to the vet day. <laughs> Okay. That could take all day. That could take all day. I could take a week. <laughs> one a day. I can't do one a day. Um, I figure if we do them all in one day, then they'll all be angry at each other at the same time. That's right. That's a good strategy, Estrita. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Friday, I've got clear. Okay. Or flexible, I should say. Do you guys mind during, do you need evening or daytime is okay? Daytime is okay for me. I do ahead. Okay. Pick a date time for you, Audra. Wednesday. Does Wednesday work? No, I can't do Wednesday or Thursday. That's right. Thank you. Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. Monday's better than Tuesday. Monday, um, I have something at 10 o'clock, and otherwise I'm open. You have a one? We have the one, right? We have the mm -hmm. patty update. Okay. Uh, two o'clock. Sure. How about two o'clock? Okay. Sounds okay. good. Wait, wait. Yep. Hold on a second. Do we have um, two thirty? Don't we have the NHS feedback? That's a little flexible with the start time. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Okay. I just don't know how long this is going to take. That's, okay. a, that's a lot. There's a lot to go through. We could probably do one thirty. And then that would give you. Okay. Can one thirty work for you guys? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Okay. All right. I'll send out invites to you all. Thank you. And now, do we want to go right into the educational programming discussion? Yeah. Okay. I'll just start with. Um, We'll start with Amy because she is here and waiting patiently. <laughs> so we will have our usually our attendance, how are our numbers looking, conversation. So I'll just start with attendance and then you can give provide an update for us. Sure. So our um, staff attendance this week has ranged from 96% present to 98%, which is we're running really, really strong in that. And our student attendance, we had the low of 92% and a high of 98%. So again, those numbers are looking pretty tremendous across the board, staff and students. Um, all right. Yeah, so um, I have a couple um, updates and like the statewide guidance that we've been granted in the last couple weeks. Um, indoor band instruction and the use of musical instruments has now been given the green light to move indoors um, following pretty specific safety protocols um, such as distancing um, masking still um, equipment accessories um, like cloth covers that go over the windblown instruments first you know catching the particles that get blown out um, and then scheduling time in between sessions. Uh, so our band, we met with all of our band folks in this district who have been nothing but eager to get back with their kids in a somewhat normal fashion. Um, at the middle school and high school level, the band room is somewhat outside of my office, so I've enjoyed listening to them play <laughs> while they've been outdoors. Um, so they've been great sports about it, but being able to move in inside has been great and the teachers are super excited. Um, chorus, for some reason, the regulations have not been granted yet for indoor singing and vocal instruction. I would hope that that at the state level would change soon. Um, I don't have any updates about that. Are they meeting outside or remotely? Most likely remotely, I haven't, I've seen them singing outside once in a while. I don't know if they have different areas that I just can't see from my window, but. Or depending on how cold it is outside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're definitely doing as much as they can remotely. Uh, have we looked into purchasing any stuff, uh, PPE stuff specifically for the instruments and the special? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 we have all that. Yeah, they have the bell, bell covers. Bell, yeah, the ones yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're you know, looking into getting all that and um, 
puppy pads for the spit valve, you know, yeah. disposal, <laughs> all that good stuff. So, so even with the masks and stuff, they're not going to let them sing inside, or I guess so far they the state hasn't lifted that regulation yeah. yet. So, I'm sure it will happen at some point. Uh, yeah. right? I hope so. Um, and then a couple different changes to guidelines as far as close contacts. Um, individuals who have had documented COVID-19 infection who are then exposed to a positive case will not need to quarantine so long as they, it's within the 90 days that they've been diagnosed. So it's kind of like a free pass if you've already had it for 90 days. Um, and then individuals who have completed their COVID-19 vaccination series um, who have been exposed to a positive case will not have to quarantine either. So that means that they've had both of their injections and it's been 14 days past the second one. So it's had time to kind of take effect and cover yourself. So not that that will affect us in the school setting anytime soon because um, teaching staff is still not on the list. Has our nursing staff been able to? Yep, like those who have wanted the vaccine are have been given the opportunity. I go for my number two tomorrow. So I heard that the second time around it might not be as pleasant as the first, but we'll see. <laughs> it's a Friday. It's a Friday. So I will <laughs> have a great weekend, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's pretty much, um, I mean, what I've got now, unless there's questions. Um, well, so one of the questions that Estrita had was whether there was any change in guidance in masking. Um, have you seen anything coming along? There hasn't been anything. I know that um, Dr. Fauci at the national CDC level had made mention of double masking, um, but as far as it being required at this point, it's not. Um, the guidance still stays pretty strong with, you know, it should be a double layer. So if you're wearing a single layer mask of any sort, plopping another one on top of that is absolutely encouraged. Um, also the masks that um, allow for a filter insert are you know, widely available and having a third layer is um, better than two, but it's still not, um, it's not in the CDC guidance as of yet. I think they're probably looking at the data for the new variants and how it, this, you know, extra layers might combat that, but there's nothing really out there quite yet. Um, but so definitely like the, the two layers fitting snugly, nose and mouth are still the gold standard okay. as of now. Thank you. And then one of the questions that I know that I ask every time you're here, <laughs> um, I still can't believe that like, it seems like everybody has access to testing except for schools. So is there any talk about like any addition? Like I know we have our this limited stash that we got yep. and what we're using that for, but it just, it seems like outside of school, anybody could go get tested with, you know, half an hour notice. It, is there still no conversation about allowing schools or staff to get access to testing or like athletics. There's there's just no nothing I, coming from the state around that. I not at this point. I think that because it's so readily available in the community and families are having a super easy time, especially like with the Walgreens that are offering it now, CVS, it's a simple online um, registration process yeah. and you can go get it done. Um, for that to happen in the school setting, I think would be overtaxing our resources where the nurses have their plates full right now. I don't know how um, additional screening from what we have currently at our fingertips would be manageable. Um, I think what I'm what I'm sort of curious about and is that in in a lot of other settings, it's mandatory to get periodic tests especially with athletics right. but it's if it's mandatory then whoever is mandating it will obviously mm -hmm. cover the cost of it so and i assume that we can't mandate that people do that if they're going to i mean there's no there isn't a cost of the test but i'm i'm just curious if there's 
like at some of the universities that and you know having students routinely tested and we're talking about a congregate living situation at that level uh, where here people, folks are coming into the school and then going out to the community and doing their thing there um, more of like a, like a screening tool randomized screening tool there hasn't been talk about doing that in the k-12 setting um, and I know some private sports organizations throughout the summer and fall were doing that for their athletes, but as far as high school level, I don't know that that's coming down the road or I haven't heard of it. Okay. Thank you. Strita has a question. Strita. Yeah. Hi. Um, so reading the news lately with all the variants that are already out there, um, including some that are not um, necessarily going to get great coverage with the vaccines. I mean, obviously the vaccines will help, but there's at least two, including one that's homegrown in California um, that can apparently hide from the body's um, auto, I mean, immune system from the antibodies. Um, and obviously the vaccines are going to catch up as they can, but in the meantime, since some of these variants are both able to spread it faster and disguise their presence, um, I know that part of the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, that we don't know more about them is that there had not been genomic testing of samples in this country much, and that is now changing. Um, it seems like it's likely that the mask situation is going to change. Obviously, we can't second guess that, but is there any um, room in the budget, in the in the funding to at least get uh, proper N95s for the teachers? With From what I'm reading, like for the students, especially since children don't tend to um, actually have the virus, even though they may carry it and distribute it, uh, they don't, they don't get sick from it as much. Um, I know that like NPR had an article yesterday that laid out different ways to improve current masks. In other words, the kids wouldn't necessarily have to buy all new things. One of the suggestions was, you know, do a four layer filter just by taking two tissues and folding them in half and stacking them. And that's inexpensive. But for the adults, um, we're dealing with a higher risk situation. Is there any room, any any way that we can provide proper, fitted, correct N95 masks for staff? So N95 masks are still only indicated for healthcare workers, um, not for the general public or even um, teachers at this point. Okay. Uh, of course, if someone were to purchase their own um, stash of N95s and wear them about, that's perfectly fine. Um, however, um, in the technical setting, N95s need to be fit tested, and that is um, and it has to be done for each individual, uh, finding the right fitting mask and being done mm -hmm. by someone who is certified in that process. That would be trapped. <laughs> Travis and all of our nurses, we went and um, did that before school started. So it took about, oh God, and I don't, this might be an inaccurate assessment, but about 10 minutes per person, if not a little bit more, to go through the whole uh, fit testing process. Mm -hmm. um, all of our nursing staff has um, access to N95s uh, at this point. Uh, but as far as um, for for all, that's not the case. It's not the recommendation for the CDC right now. Okay. Uh, like you know, Denise has said, like we've got inventory of plenty of other disposable cloth masks. I believe we probably even in face shields. Mm -hmm. uh, plenty of that to go around. Absolutely, and probably even enough masks to double up if staff. Um, would like to do so. Are the uh, surgical masks paper or polypropylene? Um, I would have to. <laughs> Here, touch. I'd have to read the uh, the box. I think. And okay. Because yeah. they're sure. saying that the polypropylene ones are. are I think we might safer. have a little bit 
a boat. Okay. We got, there's also either stuff that we purchase, and there's also I think stuff. That, I think so. these are probably yeah. propylene. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> we also have um, shipments that have been provided by the state too. Um, so, yeah. a few different right. options. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the board on or anything? Thank you. Okay. I'll continue with the educational programming, but because we're heading into the week before vacation, and I know, Denise, you asked this last time, our recommendation is that we move ahead five days prior to vacation. Um, we're not expecting, you know, right before our December break, we were expecting some um, travel, potentially some families that were getting together in some other social situations, um, but we are um, feeling that we are going to be able to make the five days before vacation and make the, you know, come back after, right after vacation. Um, but we will certainly hear from administration and school building nurses. So if there's an issue or issues coming up at certain schools, we'll be able to have that information during the week. And we do have the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday. Yeah. And even though the Patriots are not playing, really the thing that's right. ready is. So. <laughs> so that is a little gives us a little pause, but we also know that we have the five days here. So so that's our recommendation. I would make note of that, you know, February vacation, certainly people are planning on traveling, um, which is fine, but the tra main state travel requirements still stand. Um, if you're traveling outside of um, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, the requirement is to either quarantine or produce a negative COVID test prior to returning to school. So it can be one or the other, it doesn't need to be both. Um, and the test just needs to be done within 72 hours of returning to Maine. So somebody, I think it was earlier today, had posted on the parent Facebook page, um, you know, can someone point me to the guidance on travel? And I wasn't home, I just did it from my phone and I said, you know, I think look at the main CDC mm -hmm. um, because we're following that. I yep. probably should have checked with you first, but no, I, yeah, absolutely. I don't think we have anything specific on our website. We're just leading people to that. Yeah, I copy and paste that link lots of times. And okay, but um, yeah, I don't know if it's. I don't, I don't know if it's worth it to send a reminder. Like, yes, we will. Your next communication, yeah. just sort of. Yeah, as here's, a reminder. Yeah. Here's what the guy and says. we continue to say this, but. Our families have been very responsive yeah. to yeah. The, the prompting and the reminders and just um, all of that. I feel like we've got really great communication. Our schools have really great communi communication with families on that. So yeah. yeah, we will send something out probably the week before and then right when we, just as a reminder, right when we head back right in after a okay. break. Honestly, I like what people are asking. Yes, yeah, for okay. sure. No, people have been doing great. Travel planning, but, you know, right? know what I'm doing after. Right, it's good. So just a few more updates under educational programming. Um, athletics, we had our first official, official um, meaning conditioning, but a little more skills. <laughs> that was supposed to happen on Monday, but we had to um, make the decision to not have after school activities because we have students driving and we weren't sure, huh. how, you know, <laughs> how quickly it was going, to, the weather was yeah. going to impact the roads. Um, but since that time, um, today they, they did really well. They were very excited to um, head back out and do some practicing. Really strong um, following of the guidelines. And that was something that we said that we, you know, we were just, there were no excuses. It was just everybody was going to follow what we need to follow. And um, it, that's happening and that's really good. Um, so they are... Um, you know we're having we're coming up on next week and then february break and sometimes during february break we have had practices there have been some games sometimes during our february breaks so we'll be talking with um all of the local areas around us about um, any kind of getting together or any kind of more formalized uh, like basketball or something like that we'll be talking about that um, and then transportation. So one thing, I'm just gonna read you what Brenda wrote. Uh, we, um, there was a bus route in November in Berwick that was um, eliminated. 
And to manage that situation, we moved some of the students from the particular bus route to other buses. And we could handle that, no problem, with, with how many families were driving and dropping their students off. Um, but what has happened now is that as families have seen that the systems in place are working, more parents have requested that their students be transported. And we've also had a little bit of change with, we've had quite a few movements actually. And then we've had students when we made that last shift to say, do you wanna go from remote to um, in person or in hybrid? We've, so we've had families do that. So Huzzy, particularly Huzzy, has had to have a couple of shuttle runs in because the children are at Huzzy. And so Brenda has hired somebody to pick up that run, that bus run, and after vacation, they will eliminate the shuttle runs and just have that, that route running again, and that will alleviate that. There was some um, delay in notification of families, and Brenda has problem solved that through our transportation office so that when this newest change comes forward and that route gets reinstated, um, there's a, a better mechanism for, for communication for that. So sh we just wanted you to know that piece that, that so we got a bus driver. That's, <laughs> it is huge. <laughs> so that's, so those are our updates under our educational um, programming. One question on athletics, did I read that wrestling is getting pushed back to not having the same Starting time, or did I make that up? They were starting around, I think it was February 22nd. Yeah, they're later than, they were later anyway. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yes. So they're, so they're allowed to, we we've, we've they're allowed them to do conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. But the actual, you know, more specific stuff. The close contact. Sport. Right. <laughs> it's a pretty close yeah. contact sport. Yes. Yes. Indeed. yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions about any of those updates from anyone on the board? Board transitions. We just put this on the agenda because kind of at the end of one meeting. Yeah. So we just wanted to kind of like a street last at that meeting said that her term was up and not not running again. So just kind of wanted to revisit that and just hear um, what those plan, you know, what the plans are for, I think, Travis, Joanne, and, and Estrita. Was Travis still up in the air? Yeah, he was so. still up in the air last I knew. Yeah. Who's throwing on? I'm still, I'm sticking with what I said that time. Just, just I have too many things going on with um, older relatives and actually with my daughter. So I just, there's only so much. I'm the meat in the generational sandwich right now, and, and I, I just can't take on anything extra. Yeah. Well, thank you for hanging in for this year, Joey. Um, thank you. Oh, Is that one? For someone to, um, I, I think it's really important to have some new blood. I've been on a lot of times and loved it, yeah. but I think it's really important to have um, new voices and uh, I think it's important also to have someone that is, wants to be here because they care about the education of our kids. And that's going to be the main focus on how we can, you know, produce, give the kids the best opportunities to be successful. So I'm <coughs> calling people and asking people and trying, trying my best to find someone. I have to. So how does, I've been to. <laughs> what are successful ways that you've ever seen in the past to generate interest in the superintendent calling you and saying, <laughs> "Right, could you, would you please, would you please?" That's what, how I, I ended up, you know, Paul Andre. He's, okay, he called me and was mm -hmm. like, mine was oh, Sue okay. every couple of years. Oh, right. hey, Denise. But I think right. sometimes you, you need <laughs> sometimes you need someone like the superintendent to know that well, they've got faith that you can do it. Because I, I think people are just overwhelmed that this is a huge job, and I don't think a lot of people realize how how much is involved in mm -hmm. this. And I think just having the someone like like Sue or Audra picking up the phone and saying, mm -hmm. "I think you'd be great. Could you just think about it?" I think that that helps a lot. Really. Okay. 
We're happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and you guys have a good sense. I mean, we, we can maybe give you some ideas of people that we think might be in Lebanon that might be good. And but you, you know the schools, and you know the parents that are helping with the GTL, sure. and sure. that's where you now. We can't. We can't be. Um, it's it's one of those fine lines. You're not like supposed to yes. really recruit. No. <laughs> so, but we can talk to people about yes. what it entails, so that if anybody that's interested, yeah, we can give them a whole. Given overview and Nancy and, and I were, I don't know if I'm, if I'm allowed to say this, but we were agreeing that it would be nice to have some gender diversity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> well, this is interesting because if we're talking about gender, Sue and I were just talking, just talking about that this morning. It has, it yeah. has not always been this way. We've had this, the board has been very male dominated in the past. Very. And the central office, yeah. like we're, we're just a bunch of. Sorry, there's a, there's a lot of women involved now. Yeah. So it is good to you know to have it other perspectives. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And Joanne, how how many years? Eighteen. Yep. How many? Eighteen. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. You hired me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> wasn't that a good choice? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right. Um, I it's also I nice to have here. some retired teachers. Out. Oh, sorry. Is someone else talking? Go ahead. Go sorry. ahead, Rebecca. Oh, I was just going to say it's nice to have at least one or two retired teachers on the board. And I don't think we have any right now, do we? Nancy. Well, Nancy. Nancy. Yeah. Nancy's still here. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy's still here. Oh, you're retired, I guess. Are you still going to be there here next term, Nancy? What? She's got one more year. Yeah. Yes. Keep that in mind because I don't know. I think they have they give an interesting perspective. Absolutely. Um. So spread the word, I guess. Yeah. In conclusion. Mm -hmm. Um. Do we have any employment? News? We we do. We have a retirement, and it does not need a motion. But I just would like to bring it forward. Anne Marie Roy will be retiring at the end of this school year. And um, she's been an ed educational technician at North Berwick Elementary School for the past 11 years. So this is her um, submission for her retirement. So we wish her the best. And um, I know that she's been a val very valuable asset to the school, so. Thank you. Yep. Do we have any other? Um, I, I, this is sort of a, I guess, quick other. Um, for the hour before this meeting, I was sitting in on the York County School Board. Yes. Uh, maybe quarterly meeting? I actually have no idea what regularity. It, it, I just sort of go when I hear about it. Um, I would just say to anybody on the board, um, if you guys do not get those emails, I can make sure that everybody gets added to it, but if they come from the main school board association, there it's just really helpful to sort of check in periodically with other school board members uh, in the county. And um, I kind of thought everybody got those, but if you don't get them, I can add people, I can ask them to add people, but um, I, and also just, I mean, I feel like I've said this a few times, but the main school board is so the MSBA, I guess. Yep. I just feel like they send a lot of good programs and information our way, and I would urge people to read the emails. Um, if it's a webinar and you've got the time, you know, sign up for it. Uh, I don't. There's not usually a cost <coughs> anything. I'm sure if there was, we could, you know, figure out. Um, you know, but as far as I know, it's only the, the annual conference that does, but, um, you know, especially new school board members, um, there's just a lot of resources there, and I do think that the, this York County meeting is, um, especially at a time like now, it's, um, it's just helpful to hear what other school districts are going through from the school board perspective. So it's not like you're not hearing other budgets or athletic things. It's more just like how are school boards dealing with 
you know, are your meetings remote? Are you, what are your sports doing? Like what, you know, or not necessarily sports, but like what's the, the um, just kind of overall from a school board standpoint. So I find them very helpful. I had to get off this one a little bit early um, just to come here, but um, I would urge everybody on the board to take advantage of that. I feel like it would, I feel like every time I'm on one of these calls, it kind of broadens <clears throat> my thinking and um, just, uh, you know, just gives me a, um, a bit more perspective um, so I would strongly urge everybody to take advantage of whatever resources come our way as a school board, especially at a time like right now, because none of us, no matter how many of you have 18 years or one year, none of us have ever um, kind of been through something like what we're doing right now. So I guess um, I would just kind of say, I think it's beneficial to have either participation in some way that's beyond our meetings um, and that may come in the form of education or conversation or reading um, you know anything so I just I, I think as a board it will benefit us if if everybody is able to kind of I guess enhance their own position and then be able to bring that to the board in general thank you do you want to send me that link so that I can just put it in the minutes too? Yeah, and um, also with that, they um, tonight they had actually mentioned a couple of um, books that a couple of the um, board members, which I'm sh had had and thought were helpful, and I I don't I'm surprised they didn't ring a bell for me, um, but I was going to see if we could maybe get a couple yeah, of copies, for sure. um, if not for the whole board at least for like the chair and vice chair, and then we can pass them along or something. So I will, let me get those, Sue, and then I'll send you all okay, of that. Okay, sounds good. There is a budget for board supplies and books and things. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are just a couple of books, mm -hmm. and, and you know, one of them that they recommended was like for any new chair, just a reminder of, you know, how to run a school board meeting and <laughs> making sure you don't forget a couple of, you know, points of order that are important, but, um, you know, for anybody who's new at it, you know, you might not know. So, um, yeah, I'll get all that and I'll send that around. Thank you. Any other others? Um, just future reminder for, I can't say the name, but you know who I'm asking about for their update on that student? I asked a couple of meetings ago, yep. just a reminder for that. If you want to do an email, that's fine. Okay, we can do that. Yes. And I was just thinking, can we get, can we put on our uh, town page about the uh, school board position? Oh, sure. Yeah. Just, it's so, everything is so, you know, hard. You don't see everybody around anymore. It's like, it's much harder to get word of mouth around compared to what it used to be. So that might be a good way. I know a lot of people like to go on there to check the latest. Yeah. I've got to go into town office anyway next week as well. I'll pop there. Okay. What about uh, what about looking at the BCTV? Maybe they could do like an interview with Audra or Sue just to talk about the board in general. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. Is she no. BCTV still? Yeah, I think yes. yeah, they are back. Up. They are okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And for how many is your turn to adjourn? I'll second it. All right. All right. All in favor? Thank you, guys. Thank you.